How do you decide when it's time to repair something or replace something? Anybody ever struggle with, you know, "Eh, should I fix it or should I just get a new one? Uh, A couple days ago, uh, my wife and I were in the car and Renee said to me, uh, she just kind of went through the list of, you know, a few things that um, that she needed me to take care of at the house. Um, upstairs in our, uh, in our, in our bathroom, there's a, a small leak in the faucet. Um, uh, downstairs in our bathroom, in our shower, there's like a small leak in the shower head. Uh, there's a piece of molding, like a, you know, a piece of trim that needs to be replaced. And then um, in our laundry room, there's a, the shade broke. And so we need a new shade in the laundry room, right? So these four things, um, she asked me to, to take care of. And I know most of you, you'd hear something like that, right? And you'd get out a piece of paper and you start making the list of things you need to get at Lowe's, right? Like I'm on Zillow, <laughs> right? Like, like I need a new house. I mean, um, you know, repair, replace, right? Uh, that's, I just, you know, when it comes to a lot of those things, I, I, I just kind of get lost. Um, and so uh, I want to talk about, I want, I want to talk about how like this idea of, of, uh, of repairing, replacing kind of fits into to our lives. We, we, we have a tendency to do this not only with like some of the stuff that we have, whether it's, you know, that car that just seems to keep breaking down. It's like, all right, should I keep sinking money into this thing or should I just get a new one? Um, but also like just with the regimen of our lives, right? I mean, sometimes uh, we find ourselves in a place where we're not really super healthy. And so we're looking for ways to improve. You know, it's like I, I, uh, I'm not sleeping well. And so what do I need to do? What changes do I need to make so that I can, I can sleep better, right? You go to the doctors and I uh, kind of start talking about some of the things that are going on, and maybe there's a, um, you know, maybe there's a diet, you know, that they want you to begin. Uh, maybe there's a certain exercise regimen that you're supposed to jump on. Maybe there's some medications uh, that they want to prescribe to kind of help you with some of the things uh, that you're dealing with. But it's like always this question of, you know, all right, am I am I am I just tweaking something a little bit here um, to to improve on what is otherwise, you know, pretty decent? Or like, do I just am, is my diet so bad, right? Is the is my my habit of eating so poor that I need a complete uh, revolution uh, of what it is that I eat. Uh, now, take this si- same kind of idea into our into our spiritual lives. Uh, you know, I think that, and what we're going to talk about today is the tendency that I think a lot of people have with in in terms of trying to improve their lives, um, try to retrofit uh, something like. Uh, religion, you know, some commitment to some kind of religious thing, um, or, you know, here we're, you know, we're followers of Jesus, right? And, and I think that a lot of times people have this tendency to uh, to try to fit Jesus, try to retrofit Jesus into their lives. Like, you know, you all know what retrofit means, right? Uh, you know, in the business world, I, I've had the responsibility of, uh, over the years, you know, just buying machines, um, and so these machines would come in, right? And they'd, uh, you'd start running them and they, they just, they were amazing, right? When they were first brand new. Uh, but eventually something would break down. Sometimes like really, really kind of quickly into uh, owning this machine, something would break. And so when the technician came uh, to fix it, they would actually, they'd retrofit something for it, right? Because what happened was, even though this thing eventually got past the engineers and past design into production, um, over the course of time, it was discovered that, like, this was a real problem, right? Like, that this particular part of this machine doesn't work really well. Like, the machine itself, the, the, the whole of the machine is wonderful, but this thing, it doesn't work. And if we just, if we just fix it, with like kind, then we're going to have to keep on fixing it with like kind over and over and over again because there's, a, there's actually an engineering problem. So what, so what the engineers do is they, they retrofit something. They, they come up with a, a solution that's intended to be a more long-term uh, fix to that particular problem. Um, the problem is like when we, try to, when we try to retrofit our lives with Jesus, we don't actually get the full benefit of everything that Jesus wants to do uh, in our lives, right? Like if we, if we approach um, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, if we approach Jesus with this idea that it's like, all right, we're kind of walking around life and it's like, man, you know, there's just, there's something that's not quite right, right? Like there's, you know, people describe a lot of times, like there's just, there's, there's something missing, 
right? I, 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 it's, it's, not that, it's not that my whole life is, is, is bad or that it should just be thrown out and like started completely over with. It's just, you know, there, there's something missing or there's a, there's a little something that's not quite right, right? And so uh, a lot of times people, they'll, they'll, they'll find themselves in church, you know, in a church somewhere. You know, a friend invites them, right? They know they're kind of going through a difficult time. They're like, hey, you ought to come to church with me. And, you know, I've, I've really, I've found a lot of help as I've, as I've, you know, kind of embraced, um, you know, this, this, this idea that there's something, there's someone, you know, kind of bigger than I am, right? And, and um, you, should, you should just come, right? And so a person comes to church and they kind of hear and, um, and maybe, even, maybe even like wade in the waters a little bit, right? Just they, they kind of start venturing into, uh, you know, what is being talked about in, in that religious environment, you know? Um, you, you know, you should be a follower of Jesus. Like, okay, Jesus is like, he's cool, right? I mean, um, it sounds like he did a, a lot of good things and, you know, made a real positive difference in the world, right? And so, so a lot of times people, they'll kind of graft Jesus into their lives, you know, but, um, but without, without the real pervasive kind of change that Jesus actually wants to bring uh, into our lives. And Jesus addresses this. Uh, and we're going to look at, at these three parables. They're, they're pretty quick parables, um, so we'll kind of go right through them. Um, they're found in Luke chapter 5. Well, actually, they're found... Uh, in all three of the what we call the synoptic gospels, in the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, and the gospel of Luke. We're going to look at Luke's version uh, this morning. So Luke chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, and let me just begin reading it for you here. Uh, so just to kind of set up what's going on here, uh, Jesus, this, is, this, this seems to be pretty early on uh, in his public ministry. Uh, in fact, like you read the early part of the chapter, Jesus is gathering together uh, his first disciples, right? There's a, a story there of how he calls uh, one particular disciple uh, known as Levi or Matthew, uh, actually the, the namesake for the gospel of Matthew. He wrote the gospel of Matthew. And this guy was a tax collector, right? Which is just like, um, I, I, can't, I don't have time to get into it, but just like utterly crazy idea that Jesus would ask, you know, a tax collector to come and be one of his followers, and so, so Jesus is already, I mean, he hasn't, he hasn't been wholly and completely rejected, right? We're, 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 way, we're, we're a ways away from, uh, from when he is going to get arrested and tried and crucified on the cross. Like uh, right now, he's, he's, he's kind of coming on the scene, and there's, there's definitely something going on uh, in his life uh, and ministry. But there's also, people are starting to recognize that, that that's a little different, right? So this is where we pick up. Then they said to him, right? So these are, these are some, of, uh, some of the religious folks uh, who are observing Jesus and just the, just the way he was, the way he kind of did things. They said to him, John's disciples, now uh, here they're talking about John the Baptist, right? So John the Baptist, uh, he, he had come, he's Jesus's cousin and he'd come, he's preparing the way for Jesus. And, and John had, uh, he had disciples, he had people that were following him, uh, that were listening to his message and kind of helping him uh, get that message out to other people. So it says, John's disciples fast often and say prayers, right? So uh, in observing the way John the Baptist and his disciples did things, they, they largely followed the, the manners and customs of the religious tradition, right? Which included um, uh, a regular regimen of fasting and prayer. Uh, probably a couple times a week, they'd fast and pray. I know that seems really, really foreign to us. It's like the last thing we want to do, right? Especially coming off Thanksgiving. Uh, but this was, a, this was a religious exercise that the people who were like um, really committed <laughs> to, to their religion, the people that were um, sort of fanatical about, uh, about being right with God and, and, and really following all the tenets of the religion, like showing God just how serious they were about how much they loved him. They do things like this. They, they fast, they pray, right? So it says, John's disciples fast often and say prayers. And, and those are the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees being this, this uh, kind of leading religious group. Um, they do the same. But yours, right, looking at Jesus and the way he's kind of trolling around town, he says, you, yours, your disciples, they eat and drink. That is, they don't participate in the same manners and customs. They're, they're, they've, they've sort of shied away from the way, the way it's done. And Jesus said to them, something really weird. He says to them, 
listen, you can't, you can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then, and then they will fast in those days. Um, you know, so again, here we're kind of, Jesus is being sort of investigated, right? Or at least like this inquiry goes out. You know, why isn't Jesus doing it like everyone else? And uh, Jesus' response to that was, uh, he just, he, he, he takes this metaphor of, of, a, of a wedding celebration. He says, you know, in a wedding celebration, when everybody is, uh, uh, you know, partying, celebrating, you know, this beautiful thing that's happening, like that would not be an appropriate time to ask the guests of that celebration to not eat. Right, that, what that, that, that celebration is all about eating, right, and, 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 and drinking and being together. Uh, and, and so in the same way that it would be inappropriate for uh, the guests of a wedding to not eat, so it would be inappropriate for my disciples to fast while I'm here with them. But there's going to come a time when it will be appropriate Again, so Jesus almost seems to be alluding to a time when he is going to be rejected. And there will come a time when there will be a, a space for people to, to sit back and reflect and, and maybe to fast again. But um, in answer to this kind of question, now why doesn't Jesus, why isn't he doing it like everyone else? Then Jesus goes into these parables, right? So uh, the next verse says he also told them a parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. So Jesus uses this illustration, right, that involves these two different garments. One is old, threadbare, having just been used, probably has exceeded its life expectancy, right? And, and now there's, there's a tear in it. He says the last thing somebody would do is take a new garment and cut a piece out of that garment in order to patch up the old one. Like nobody would do that, right? So that's the parable. And then he goes on to another one. And, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, if they did, the new wine will burst the skins, it will spill, and the skins will be ruined, along with the wine, of course, right, which is now spilled out all over the ground. No, new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, wants new because he says the old is better. So we're talking about, again, Jesus is being asked, why, why is he not doing it in a way in which we're accustomed? And Jesus gives these, these metaphors, right, speaks in these parables about how, you know, first of all, there's a problem of compatibility that Jesus was starting to introduce to the idea of how he either fit in or didn't fit in with the religious system as it were. There was a problem of compatibility, right? Jesus says the new cloth is incompatible with the old cloth. He says it wouldn't match it. Um, in the other gospel accounts, in Matthew and Mark, uh, the way they describe the parable is Jesus says, nobody takes, nobody takes a new patch, and uses it to mend an old garment, right? So the idea is that this old garment has been worn, has been shrunk and shrunk, like it's a pre-shrunken uh, 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 garment. And, and, and now having, having already uh, gone through an entire lifetime of shrinking, like to the point where it's not going to shrink anymore, you take, a, you take a new piece of cloth, an unshrunken piece of cloth, and mend a hole with it, Right there, they describe how that patch will tear away, right? As, as it becomes shrunk and it's going to tear away from that old garment. And the, the, the rend, the hole, is actually going to become worse than it was in the beginning. Um, 
some of you might relate to, you know, this. Uh, yeah, I have an older computer. Uh, I've had an older computer. And uh, I... I I've, I've bumped into this a number of times. You have this, you have this piece of software that you need to run on this computer, right? Uh, and you try to install the software. Maybe it's an upgrade to a piece of software you already have, but you try to upgrade, and you can't because that new upgrade to the software isn't compatible with the operating system of the computer. Like, it's not going to work. You know, you, you, you run the installer, and immediately you're given this error message, right, that the software you're trying to install is not compatible with the operating system. So you have to upgrade the operating system in order for, to make the software work. Right, so then you go to upgrade the operating system. Uh, but when you do that, you discover that the upgraded version of the operating system that runs the computer, it's not compatible with the hardware of the computer itself. You know what that means? That means you will never run that piece of software on that particular computer. They're not compatible. And so Jesus seems to be describing the same kind of thing about, you know, the manner and the message that he was bringing into this conversation. You know, as Jesus considers the old way, right? Because th- that's what it was all about. Like, people, are, people are wrestling with how Jesus was interfering with the old way. Uh, many of us, you know, as you study the Bible, you, you know, uh, the people of Jesus' day were living according to the law of Moses, right? The law of the Moses was the law of the land. This is how you did religion, This is how you serve God. This is how you pleased God, right? You followed the law, right? And to the degree that you followed the law demonstrated the degree to which you were committed to God. And now Jesus comes in, right? And and, and, and the reason why he's asked the question, like, why aren't you fasting and praying like, you know, the Pharisees are and like John's disciples are? Like, why aren't you doing things the way they've always been done, Uh, Jesus is almost suggesting this idea that, hey, you can't take what I'm bringing. Like, you can't just take a piece of it and use it to mend the old way. Um, What we're talking about with the old way is something that ultimately needs not, not to be fixed, not to be adjusted, not to be tweaked. It needs to be replaced. Wholly replaced. Um, the, the law, as it were, that God had given to uh, his people was for a time and a purpose. And it had come to serve its time and purpose in the same way that, you know, a garment can serve its time and purpose until which it is no longer useful and needs to be replaced. And so Jesus is projecting the idea that he's bringing something that's not, it's not a fix to something that was old and in need of repair, but it is something that needs to be replaced. The picture that Jesus gives of of taking a piece of the, the new garment in order to uh, to, to mend the old garment, it gives us the picture of, like, you take that, you, you've ruined the new garment, right? Not only does that patch not really do anything to improve on the old garment, right? Because in this parable, it, it doesn't match, right? Um, functionally, it's not even going to work, right? Because it's going to actually create a bigger tear in the old garment than was there originally. So not only is it not effective in fixing the old, but it also ruins the new. And the result of that is this disastrous, right? Taking part of Jesus's way actually ruins all of it. And we've all witnessed that. Right? We've all seen, we've all witnessed, you know, if you're here today and you're, you wouldn't say, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus, like you just, um, you kind of been looking from the outside and, and, you know, as you've considered and thought about and looked at and studied, you know, Christianity, maybe, 
maybe you have, you've struggled because the versions of Christianity that you've seen being displayed in the world are like, I don't want to be a part of that. Now, why is that? Why is it that some people, in observing what people who claim to be following Jesus, the, the, the way they are, the way they live, the way they behave, why, why is that so unattractive to some people? Well, I think a lot of times it's because they haven't actually really fully immersed themselves in the idea of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What they've done is they've they kind of they've taken a piece of Jesus. They've taken a piece of Christianity and they tried to mend, you know, some particular hole in their own lives. But for all practical purposes, the, the, the majority of their lives are still pursuing whatever they were before. There, there hasn't been this wholesale replacement or change. And what it does is it, it actually ruins the testimony of real, true, authentic Christ following, like what that is supposed to be and what that's supposed to look like. Now, um, those of us that are followers of Jesus, like we're all, we're all culpable in that, right? Like who of us have not, from time to time, given Jesus a bad name? Hello? Right? I mean, we, we've all done it. We, we do do it. Like there are, there are ways in which, you know, if, if people knew, like it, um, if people could observe uh, you know, all that goes on, you know, in the life of a Christian, I mean, they're going to find, they're going to find hypocrisy, right? Has anybody here not ever been a hypocrite? Has anybody here not ever, uh, you know, kind of set themselves up as, you know, believing or thinking one way, but the, you know, acting, behaving in a, in a different way, right? I mean, yeah, that. So the problem with so many is that like they they just they're kind of content and happy with that. Like I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to let my life be pretty much as it was and you know I'm just going to I'm going to take this little patch of Christianity and just kind of like, you know, fold it in there. Um, this kind of religious what we call religious syncretism, right? The combining of um, you know, of two or more ideas, philosophies, religions, things like that. This was tried. We see, it, we see it was tried in the Bible itself. Right after Jesus left and the church was born, now you had, you had this, this subset of Judaism, right, known as, as what came to be known as Christianity, right? These people that uh, were ethnically speaking, they were Jewish, uh, but were, were now trying to follow Jesus. And man, they, they struggled. They struggled with understanding what this new identity was all about. And, and, and for a long time, they tried to like combine the two together, right? That, that like following Jesus was an improvement to Judaism. And, and, and it, it, it caused some problems among themselves, right? Because now they were trying to fulfill the mandate and requirements of this old way, this old system, while they had this kind of conflicting, somewhat contradictory new way, right, where the two didn't work because there's a problem of incompatibility. Um, and I, I think like in observing the dynamic of what happens there is you actually, you end up like when you try to syncretize, you know, two or more things that don't work, to, you, you actually, you just ruin them both. Like you were ruining, um, they were ruining the, the purpose and the intent of the law by trying to bring the way of Christ into that. And then, of course, they were also ruining the way of Christ in the way that they were trying to also fulfill the old way of the law. Uh, it, it, you know, as I was thinking about that, it made me think of uh, what, what Jesus speaks to the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Some of you are familiar with this, right? Jesus, as he observes the operation of this one particular church, uh, the church of Laodicea, he says, he says to them, I know your works, right? Like he looks at, he, 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 he analyzes the sum 
of, you know, this spiritual community. And he says, I know your works. Like, I know what you're all about. I know your mission statement, your vision statement. I know your values. Uh, I, I, like, I, I've looked at your calendar, right? I can, see, I can see what you're all about. And here's his assessment of them. He says, you're neither hot or cold. And he said, you know, I would, I would rather... If it were up to me, I would rather that you were either hot or cold, right? That is, I would rather that you were either like all in, holy, and completely surrendered to me, following me as master and Lord, or, 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 or cold, like just like not pretending at all that you're even aspiring to be. I, I, I wish that you were one of the two, but instead, like you're lukewarm. You're this, 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 this kind of, this, this yucky mixture, and it, he uses the language. He's like, I want to I wanna throw you up out of my mouth. Like, he actually says that to this church because of their lukewarmness. So taking part of Jesus' way ruins all of it. That's the problem with compatibility. There's another problem. The other problem, I think, that's being introduced here is the problem of containment. Right, so then Jesus, after he talks about the, the, the two unmatching pieces of cloth, he talks about this thing with wine and wineskins. Um, in case you don't understand what's going on here, uh, these wineskins were used to store uh, unfermented juice that would, of course, over time ferment and become wine. And so what Jesus says is when, when, when this juice is put into the skin you know, that's been prepared for that very purpose, the process of fermentation expands the skin. It stretches, you know, the stretchiness of the skin. The problem, though, is if you take that wine skin that has now gone through that process of fermentation and has it been expanded, has already, has already reached its maximum usefulness, and then, and then you take brand new juice and you use that wineskin to store that same juice, when that juice ferments and expands, the container is not going to be able to hold it. It's going to burst. And so you're going to lose the wineskin, which, you know, might have otherwise been used to, you know, store other liquids, you know, or, you know, perhaps it had some other purpose for which it could be recycled, right? So you lose, you lose the wineskin, and then, of course, you lose that entire batch of wine, as well, right? This is a problem of containment. And what Jesus was looking at and what he wanted for his audience to understand was the difficulty or the problem of how they wanted to, they wanted to force Jesus into their container, right? If you thought about the old way and the old system and the law, if you thought about, you know, people thinking about their own lives, like this is the container of my life, and they're trying to force Jesus into it. But the problem is, the law had already gone as far as it could go. It had taken people as far as it could. Like, like I said at the beginning, the law was designed for a time and a purpose. It's not that the law was bad, right? But the law wasn't God's ultimate plan. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the real remedy with which God was going to save the world. It was something, it was, a, it was a stand-in for a time and a purpose. And so to take Jesus and try to force him into the container of that system that had already taken us as far as it could take us was going to destroy both the intent and purpose of the law, as well as the work and the hope of the new thing that Jesus was bringing into our lives. What we have to understand is that, you know, Jesus isn't an add-in. And this is the way a lot of people treat Jesus like he's an add-in. You know, like you're making a, a pot of soup, right? Or, or a stew or something, right? What do you do? You know, like over time, I mean, you've kind of put everything in the pot, right? You stir it from time to time, right? And then what do you, you taste it, right? right? Anybody else do that, right? Like, it's missing something, right? And so what do you do? You, 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 you use your sense of taste to figure out, like, what is the thing that this, 
this recipe is currently missing and you add it in in order to make it better. And, and a lot of people, they treat Jesus like that. You know, like our lives are this, this, this pot of soup, this pot of stew, right? And again, it's like, uh, this is something not quite right. Let me just, let me, let me mix in a little of Jesus. And the problem with that is that the gospel, the gospel is a, I, I, I mean, there's no way I can even actually emphasize this to the degree which it deserves. The gospel is a radically new way through which human beings encounter God. It is something the world had never seen. The gospel is a radically new way through which humans encounter God. And in order for it to have its proper effect, it has to have room for its full expression. See, the problem is like we we squeeze it into the space that we want to allow it to work, right? I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to take what, what little bit I'm going to try and I'm going to try and take this 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 thing, um, this way of Jesus, the gospel, and I'm going to I'm going to force it into my container. Problem is, my container can't hold it. Some of you have experienced this. Some of you have you've walked through life, and you've actually had the experience where you're like, I have taken myself as far as I can go. Right? And at that point, it's like that you, you just, you fall on your knees. You fall on your face before God. And you're like, God, I give up. I have, I have taken this thing as far as I can go, and I can't go any farther. I need you to take over. That's what, that's what it looks like to take the wine, the new wine, and pour it into a container of fresh wineskins rather than trying to force it into some already completely maxed out system. You know, there's this story when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, right? Uh, she, she asks him, she's like, hey, you know, your people uh, think that you're supposed to worship God here. We think that you're supposed to worship God there. Like, which is it? And Jesus just like, he shakes his head. He's like, oh, you, you, you completely missed it. Like, you just, you got it all wrong. It, the answer is neither. Like, God, God can't be contained or confined to a particular place and time, right? That's, like, that's how it worked for the people of Jesus' day. The, the idea was that to experience God, you, you, you went to the temple, right? You went to this building, and, and you walk in, and, 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 and you got as close as you could get, but you couldn't even, you couldn't even go all the way, right? The presence of God was considered to, to dwell in the, the inner sanctum of the inner sanctum, right? It, like, you were two rooms removed from where the presence of God was considered to be. Like, you couldn't even get that close. You just tried to get close enough, right? Because that's where God was. Jesus is like, man, you got it all wrong. Like, God can't. God can't be confined to this one little place. You think about, we did this whole series on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and, and as human beings, like, we can't even do justice to what Jesus teaches. In you read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Like, you really read that. You study that. We can't even begin to do justice to the degree that Jesus was turning upside down everything that people thought. Everything that people understood. People in Jesus' day, they were looking for a Messiah that was going to bring a revolution of power, but Jesus instead, he started a revolution of the heart. See, Jesus isn't an add-in. Jesus, instead of being an add-in, he affects or wants to affect every single part of us. When we, when we really allow Jesus into our lives, we're talking a wholesale, pervasive change of everything. It's not, you know... Um, I, 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 I accepted Jesus and I started going to this church and, and, you know, so I try, I try not to swear so much, you know, especially around kids, right? Like I try to be careful with my language. Um, 
you know, or, or like whatever, whatever it is, the, whatever those things are that we're like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a religious person now, so I shouldn't do that, or I shouldn't go there, or I shouldn't say that. Like whatever those things are, however we define what it looks like to be a little more religious than we were before, like that's not what it's about. The introduction of Jesus into my life, the pouring of that fresh wine into a fresh container. It is a wholesale that is supposed to affect every part of us. Jesus says, listen, I didn't come to improve on the way in which you're doing life. I came to introduce a whole new way. I didn't come to try to enhance the forms of religion that we're all practicing, you know, to, to just bring a, 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 you know, kind of an elevated, you know, benefit and purpose to the fasting that we're doing and the praying that we're doing and, you know, all those things, like, you know, all the, all the things that people do at the temple. Listen, everything that the temple did in the way in which it organized and led people in religion, everything the temple did, Jesus did better. Jesus said, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't come to, to try to, you know, make it a little easier for you to, to follow the law. No, he brings a whole new spirit into the hearts and lives of men and women. That, that Jesus' presence in our lives is pervasive. It, 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 uh, it affects our intellect. It affects um, our bodies. It affects our will. Our desires even. Like the things that, like it changes what I want. <laughs> Think about that. When Jesus comes into your life, when you embrace him fully as he is meant to be embraced, he actually begins to transform the way you think, the way you see things, even the very desires of your heart. And so the point I think of these parables is that Jesus couldn't retrofit a religion. Jesus couldn't be this retrofit. He couldn't, it's not like the religion that God had established through the law, through Moses, and given to his people, that, you know, suddenly as he and the angels are hanging around heaven, and they're like, you know, they're not doing it right. Like, there's something broken about this. What should we do, right? And so he goes to the engineering department of the angelic body, right? And they start thinking and brainstorming and designing. Oh, well, here's an idea. Here's how we can, here's how we can patch up this hole, right? And then they said, you know, then Jesus comes and is born into the world as a, as a retrofit to this religious system. Jesus can't retrofit a religious system. And for us... Jesus can't retrofit my life. And Jesus can't be a retrofit to your life. We've all tried it, probably. Or some of us are trying it. Some of us maybe haven't even gotten to the point where we've tried it yet. But Jesus can't be a substitute part for a system of living that is holy and utterly and hopelessly broken. Jesus has to repair. I mean, replace and not repair. And then Jesus, uh, this final verse, verse 39, let me read it again because it's been a while. This is like, this is almost a third parable. Jesus says, and no one after drinking old wine wants new because he says the old is better. Uh, probably a better translation is not that the old is better, but that the old is good. What's Jesus saying here? So Jesus, he, he describes how it's, it's the way he, what he is bringing is incompatible with what has been. What has been cannot contain what he wants to do, right? So that's, that's what Jesus is introducing in the parables of the, the cloth and the wine and the wineskins. And then here, he kind of closes out with this observation. No one after drinking old wine wants new because he says the old is good. And here's the challenge. The challenge for us as we listen to and consider a message like this, what we've talked about this morning, is we all experience the same degree of desire for the old that the people 
who are being challenged by Jesus experience. The challenge is the old is good. Right? Uh, how many of you just, you prefer the old way? <laughs> right? Some of you cooked Thanksgiving, you know, either the main course or certain side dishes. Anybody, anybody can, like, make this side dish and you made it the way your mom made it, or dad made it, or your grandma, or grandpa made it, right? Like the recipe that's been handed down. And if, 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 if somebody else, you know, said, I'm going to bring the sweet potatoes, you're like, nah, uh, 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 right? <laughs> like, you don't want that other person's sweet potatoes. You've got the sweet potatoes, the sweet potatoes to die for, right? Because they're grandma's recipe. It was passed down to your mom. It's been passed down to you. This is how sweet potatoes are prepared. Right? The old is good. Somebody comes to you and says, oh, you really got to try these sweet potatoes. Uh, 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 no, thank you. Why would I do that? I'm already perfectly satisfied and content with what I have. And so this is the observation Jesus makes. This is the challenge that we all face. He knew that people in his audience, many of them were sitting there perfectly happy, perfectly satisfied with what they had with the old way. So much so that there wasn't even this desire being cultivated in their hearts for the new. It's the exact same challenge that you and I face in our lives today. Jesus is describing a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift that every single one of us ultimately needs to yield to. Here are some of the challenges. Um, just like the people of Jesus' day, they were born into a religious system that that's all they knew. And for them, it was good. Like, this is how it's done. This is how it's always been done. This is how it will always be done, right? You just, you accept it. You participate in it. And you're good, right? It was good. And there was, there was a lot of good about it. And you and I, you know, we've, we've been born into a whole lot of good, haven't we? Like, wouldn't you say that most, you know, most of your life, most of your experience has been or is good? We were born into, for instance, we were born into humanism, like this, this philosophy of humanism, this idea that, hey, we're smart enough and we're good enough that we can solve the world's problems, Right? We can earn a place among the good by adopting and practicing certain virtues. That is, you know, humanism teaches us that if we will be a virtuous people, if we will practice certain virtues, we will ultimately, through the strength that we together bring into the world, we can solve every problem the world has if we're willing to do that, right? That's humanism. We were born into individualism, especially, you know, for us living here in the United States. We were born into this idea that we're free to express ourselves however we wish, right? Did we not grow up with that idea taught to us that you and I, we have the freedom to express ourselves however we wish. I can dress however I want. I can act however I want. I can talk however I want, right? I am free to express myself however I wish. Just as long as I don't want, you know, as long as we don't break the one cardinal rule, which is don't hurt anybody else. Right? This is individualism. As long as you don't hurt anyone else, you can do whatever you want. And you could be defined, described as good. We were born into prosperity. You think about it, you know, for us, for most of us, all of our basic needs are met. Right? I'll bet most of us came from our homes last night. Most of us ate dinner yesterday and lunch earlier and breakfast perhaps even to start the day. All our basic needs are met. We have an expectation that we can live a long, healthy life. And so we're actually, we're bred in such a way that like we don't really feel like we need to depend on someone or something else. And so like we're good. A lot of people just walk through this life. It's all good. And finally, we're, we're born into a world full of pleasure. Um, 
There are a million things that we can do to make us feel good. And it's not that any of these things are like inherently bad or evil, right? Pleasure is not evil. Prosperity is not evil. Expressing yourself individually is not evil. Practicing virtue <laughs> among other human beings, like that's, there's nothing evil about that. The problem is like when we're when we resolved that like that's good and that's good enough, what else could I need? That's the challenge we face. We face it every, every day as we are challenged to fully surrender ourselves to Jesus, to give our whole lives to him. Not just, not just a part, not just a patch, not just a, you know, can I, can, I, can I squeeze Jesus into, you know, my life as it is? Can I just, can I add him in? Now the question is, are we really willing to surrender ourselves wholly, fully, completely to Jesus? Because what he wants to bring is actually a revolution of our entire hearts, our entire selves. The old is good. But Jesus says, you know what? I've got something better. Will we accept that? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that uh, you would just help us uh, as we consider what this might mean for each of us. Lord, I know we, we sit here uh, in various places, spiritually speaking. Uh, we sit here in various places uh, with regard to how we are committed to the gospel and to the way of Jesus. But Lord, I'll bet that for each of us, there is some room for improvement. There's room for us to have our whole lives radically changed, radically transformed in the way that you want to work. I pray that you would forgive us for our tendencies to just try to patch you in, add you in, make you fit into what otherwise is a life that we are living autonomously and according to our own wills and desires. God, would you help us to see something fresh, something new, a wholesale change that you want to bring into our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name.